Today we are excited to talk about true crime with April Moore and Jane Ann Terzillo. April Moore is the former director of Northern Colorado Writers, an association for writers offering classes, workshops, and an annual conference. She is also the author of Folsom's 93, The Life and Crimes of Folsom Prison's Executed Men, Linden Publishing, 2013. She is also the author of several articles, essays, a women's fiction, and a young adult manuscript that is impatiently awaiting edits. April is currently working with a new publisher on a revised edition of Folsom's 93, set for publication in fall 2023, and will graduate summa cum laude, if all goes well, in June 2022 with her bachelor's in criminal justice. Author Jane Ann Terzillo, who's beside me right now, is a multinational Federation of Press Women award winner for her books in journalism. She has been nominated twice for the Agatha Award for her Ohio-based vintage true crime books. She started her writing career as a journalist and worked her way up to become one of the original owners of a large weekly newspaper, where she covered police, fire, and hard news. Before she turned to writing books, she wrote short stories and articles that were published in newspapers and magazines across the United States and Canada. She is a graduate of the University of Akron with degrees in criminal justice technology and mass media communication. She is a member of the National Federation of Press Women, Society of Professional Journalists, Mystery Writers of America, and Sisters in Crime. Her most recent books are Wicked Women of Ohio, Ohio Heists, Historic Bank Holdups. Is that one book? Yeah, that's one book. That's one book. <laughs> Train robberies, jewel stings, and more, and Wicked Cleveland. Why don't I start with you, April? I don't know you as well. Can you tell us a little bit about how you got started in true crime and where you came from, you know, before that? Sure. I had been writing for, I feel like, since I was a child, but I probably started taking it more seriously, you know, early 2000s. And I had written a women's fiction manuscript and and had been shopping it around for a while and kind of was getting frustrated with that. And, and really the true crime project really sort of fell on my lap um, in 2008. It was kind of a meant to be sort of thing, I feel like. Um, it kind of actually starts back, my great, great aunt was married to a guy, Tom. He was a bookie in LA. And he was 30 years older than her. And sometime in the 40s, I believe, he went to Folsom Prison to collect from an inmate. And instead, he came back with a box of mugshots and a um, like a 40-page text that was chronicling the history of Folsom from the 1870s until 1943, author unknown, and so all these mug shots and and he didn't know what to do with them so he put them in a box in a, in the closet and sort of just forgot about them and when he passed away in 1979 my aunt found them and she vaguely remembered them she thought maybe the warden had given them to him but you know when we were kids she would bring them out and we would make up stories about them it was just kind of this weird morbid sort of thing um, that my aunt had and and it wasn't until 2008 my aunt had passed away and and my father had passed away the year before and he was a writer and he was going to write about these men he was thinking about doing some research and and so when I was going through his writings I came across a copy of the text that he had and I thought oh my gosh I completely forgot about these stories these these photographs and so I contacted my grandfather to see if he had them. And he said, you know, granddaughter, I, I almost threw those out. And so glad he didn't. He sent them to me. And on the back of um, every mugshot, so Folsom only executed 93 men. So it was between 1895 and 1937. So these were all the mugshots of all the 93 men. On the back was their name, uh, when they were received, and just a little bit of information about them. So basically, it was just kind of, well, I have no idea what this is. I have no idea what I have here, if it's anything at all. But I'm going to start Googling each one and see what I find. And of course, newspaper articles and, and other documents 
came up and it just sort of snowballed from there. And five years later, um, I had a book. <laughs> so, yeah. Is every man represented in the book? Yes. Yeah. Every wow. single one. So, yeah. <laughs> and And so that was certainly a consideration when it came to publishing was, you know, do I have enough, you know, am I going to have this thousand page book, um, which was certainly not possible. So yeah, it was definitely a, uh, a trick to kind of give enough information about them. Um, and so that I could fit them all in there. So yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. I, I, even to this day, I'm still researching and still finding more information about them all. So I, I enjoy it. <laughs> it sounds fascinating. And we'll have more chances to ask you more detail about that, sure. especially with the research. So I think it's kind of funny that you both write historical true crime. So maybe I should just call it vintage true crime. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I, I don't actually know anybody who write current true crime. So that might be another episode if Jackie can find someone. Jane. Tell us about how you got started writing true crime. Okay, well, I have always had a love of history, and that dates back to when I was a little kid. Um, my grandmother would take us to the, uh, my grandmother, we were all born in Michigan, and so Granny would take us to uh, the town where she was born, which was Coleman, Michigan, a very small town up the, the center of the state, and she would take us to the um to the cemetery and we'd spread it. She'd spread a blanket out and we'd have bologna sandwiches on, you know, on wonder bread and uh, you know, with mustard and dill pickles always had to have dill pickles. And uh, we wanted to have Kool-Aid, but she would only serve us milk. <laughs> and so we would eat, you know, it was a very tiny cemetery at that time. And so after we'd eat our lunch, then she would take us around to each tombstone and tell us who the people were and what they had to do with the town. And many of them were, you know, like my great grandmother, uh, my great, great grandmother, great grandfather. Um, and so it was all this history. And I just, I just really loved it. And granny was great at telling stories. So um, I grew up, you know, loving history and, then when I decided I, I wanted to write, I wasn't 100% sure what I wanted. I knew I wanted to do something historical, um, but I joined a, um, a class uh, at the University of Akron, and it was a um, continuing education class, and it was on freelance writing. And so we all pretty much wanted to do the same thing. We wanted to write books, and we formed a club, and we met once a month. And we would read to each other and we would talk about it and um, critique and, and everything. And it was just a great, great uh, group of people. So one time, uh, one, of the, one of the women and I went to a, um, a conference uh, that was held by a magazine called the Western Reserve. And it is no longer in publication now. But that got me interested, and I thought, oh, I can do this. I can write, you know. So this other woman's name was Kathy. And so Kathy and I decided we would go to the Summit County um, Historical Society to just look stuff up, see if there was something that caught our eye that we wanted to write about. And so I was a young mother, and I had to take my son with me. And he was in one of those kind of like umbrella strollers, like he was probably like two, maybe three. And he was bored, of course, <laughs> but he was in this stroller and he pulled a book out of the shelf and it fell open to the story of an old time counterfeiter. And I started to read it and I just, I fell in love and I thought, well, okay, this is it. This is, you know, this is where I go with this. <laughs> and so I, I wrote, um, I wrote a couple of articles uh, about him and sent one to the uh, New Orleans Times Picayune and that one won my first uh, National Federation of Press Women Award. Oh wow. And then I I also published one in um, you know, a couple other magazines. I can't it's been so so long ago now. Uh, I can't remember one probably was the Western Reserve. 
no, I think something else was in the fed. But anyhow, I, I published it three times, three different articles, oh, wow. and then decided, you know, there's enough. I couldn't quit researching him. So I finally got enough, and I wrote a book which was heavily fictionalized, fictionalized. Mm-hmm. so that's what got it, it never got published. It's still sitting in there in the um, <laughs> Uh, in the closet. Um, someday I will probably dig it out and, and uh, dust it off and uh, edit it and, and send it out again. But that's kind of, you know, that's kind of what got me started. And then I just, from there, I decided, well, I needed a degree in criminal justice, of course, if I would talk about this and and write about it. So the, um, I, I went to night school. And so the head of the, um, uh, the head of the department had his um, office right there by where one of my classes was. And um, he used to like to come out and we we would take a break midway through. He used to like to come out and talk to the students. And so I told him that I was interested in writing. And he said, well, bring me something that you've written. So I brought him the the story of um, James Brown was the name of the counterfeiter. And he read it while I was in class. And when I came back out of class, he handed me a um, an address and somebody that I should contact. And it was her, that they were looking for somebody to do, um, you know, to be a, a reporter. And so I applied and I got the job. And because I had a de- or was getting a degree in criminal justice, I got to do all the police and fire news. And um, then we, a bunch of us broke away from there and started our own newspaper. So... That's kind of the the long story. (laughs) A lot of stuff I didn't know. So Jane and I have been friends for what, like 12 or 13 years? years? Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I knew some of it, but. That's so interesting, Jane, because I'm I'm the same way. I absolutely love history. So I felt like this was just meant to be. And somehow the, you know, true crime in history doesn't seem to be quite so bloody. Yes. As if we we were writing it today. Yes. I feel like it's out of context, so I I can't apply it to my life or put it into into contemporary context, so it doesn't freak me out as much. (laughs) That would be interesting to ask someone who's writing about more current cases. Well, the next question is about how do you choose the cases you report on? And April, I think you talked a little bit about that already, but (laughs) did you have anything you wanted to add? Um, I think what's interesting for me, I think what this is kind of shows me. Um, and, and I think because I love history and I do love, I'm interested in crime. I think that's probably where my focus would be for other stories. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I kind of, I, sometimes I kind of thought these projects sort of come along on their own and, and when you look for them is when you can never find them. But, um, yeah, I, I think the ones that, to me, it's very interesting to unearth stories that haven't been told and that's kind of my interest and and kind of seeing how are they relevant today how can we learn from them you know interesting things like that where I kind of feel like you know this is an important story that never got told that deserves to be told looking for crimes a lot of times are they unsolved oh that's an interesting question I don't know you know I mean so much of my focus so far has just been on Folsom's 93 so but you know as I'm doing a lot of research for it and I'm sure Jane, you've come across this as well as, you know, especially looking at old newspaper articles and things is you see so many other really fascinating topics and stories that I mean, like if I had more time, I'm like, oh, I'm going to go, I'm gonna, I sometimes I'll jot down things to go back when this is all done to kind of look to see whatever happened with that. Um, Cause it is, it can be very distracting <laughs> Because you just keep, you know, there's so many other things I come across in my research. I'm thinking, oh, that would make a great story. Or, ooh, I want to find out more about what happened there. But it's, it doesn't necessarily have to be unsolved. Um, sometimes just the journey to having um, an outcome is, is really the interesting part. The journey and the meandering and the puzzle and how all the puzzle pieces come together is what I find really interesting, too. I have to uh, I have to say every everything that uh, April said was you know, pretty much, pretty much the way I feel. It just, um, I like to do ones that have not been, uh, uh, you know, covered a lot. You know, for instance, I, I won't do, you know, Marilyn Shepard or, um, oh, what's the big one in Cleveland, the old one. Um, yeah, I like to to do ones that, um, uh, that have 
you know, have not uh, had a lot of press. I don't want to do one that the torso murders. murders, Yes. (laughs) <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, that's okay. You know, I I don't want to do one where anything happens to children or to animals or that are too bloody. Um, I I like um, I like theft. I like you know bank robberies. I like con women. I like to write about women a lot. Um, and it it's hard to tell. You know, you just you run across something and it just. It speaks to you, just just what April says. It just it just speaks to you. That's good. I think scammers are so interesting. There's a new podcast that I, well, it's not new, but it's new to me that I just discovered. I haven't listened yet, but it's called Scam Goddess. 40 episodes, and they're all about different scams. I'm like, ooh. Ooh, sounds good. Yeah. Be good. <laughs> yeah. So let's talk a little bit about research. So both of you have done a lot of research. So Jane, why don't I start with you this time? Sometimes I think research is why I do this. I just absolutely love to do the research. I uh, I like to find out every single fact that I possibly can. I you know I've learned so much how to research while I've been doing this. Um, when I was uh, when I was a police reporter, uh, the cops used to say to me, "Well." You know, we can't hide anything from you because if you want to know, you're going to find it somehow. Uh, it's just my love of research. And then, of course, you know, writing it and putting it all together is just so much fun to me. I'm the same way. <laughs> what do you, well, I guess I asked both of you, what do you do? Well, like what's your uh, MO? Okay, well, you know, Every case, and I'm sure that April's going to tell you the same thing, every case is different because you're going to go different places to get that information. Um, but, of course, I, I subscribe to um, uh, two uh, historical newspaper d- databases, um, but there are very good ones you can get for free at, uh, at the library. And, you know, Google. Sometimes I just start out with Google, and you'll find a whole list of stuff um, – on, on Google, and that will tell you, you know, where else to go. Wikipedia, I, I use it. I don't use the article itself, but what I do use is the, um, uh, the bibliography at yeah. the end. You know, I check to see whether there's a book on the subject. Um, I have something called um, journalism tools that there's a whole different, you know, different places you can go to find different things. Um, I go to the FBI website, um, police, police files, uh, and reports, uh, court, uh, court documents, just, you know, like I say, it, and sometimes I'm able to track down, uh, um, grandchildren and, you know, and great grandchildren that can talk about things. It's just, you know, like I say, every, everyone is different. That's really, that's a lot, I'm a librarian and that's way more research than I know how to do. You should give me a And then I go to you. If I can't find it, I go to you. I call you up and say. History is not my forte. I do have a person on my staff who's really good at history. So next time we'll hook you up. Please do. So April, you did a lot. If you had 93 people, so what was, was every single person or? In a way. um, Yeah, it's. I mean, Jane really explained it exactly kind of my process as well and the, the sources I go to, especially just starting out. I mean, thank goodness for Google. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I probably have all together over a million words of notes just on this book. And, and you know, like Jane said, it is so much fun because I think, you know, with history, historical crimes like these like I love research too and it's just it's that you know puzzle lover in me that just likes to okay here's all these components here's as many facts as I possibly can ascertain and and let's put it all together and then to write it is just so much fun but uh yeah I think I would I try the book lends itself very well to um, breaking it down into manageable pieces So, you know, essentially 93 different components. So I can just tackle one at a time, do, you know, kind of exhaust my Google search. And that includes 
yes, those newspaper archive sites <laughs> as well, and and um, Google Books, because Google Books will also have um, court uh, court reporter um, text, and so they'll have Supreme Court decisions and you know, appellate court decisions. So that was really helpful to find some of those. Um, I spent a lot of time at the archives in California, the state archives in Sacramento, other places, you know, there's so many great resources that I don't think people really realize is available to them. So libraries, history museums, um, public records departments, courthouses, a lot of courthouses have archive departments. I, you know, at some point though, I do have to like, all right, I, I can only do so much. Um, and, and I think that's, I would have a 2000 page book if I put everything <laughs> I could find. And, and I do have to learn to like, it's, it's okay. You know, it's okay if you don't get every shred of information and you're not going to find everything, but if you can get a, you know, enough information to tell the story the best way that um, it needs to be told or, um, then that's okay. Um, but it, it's hard to know when to stop. <laughs> Um, and just say, okay, you're going to, you're never going to be done. You're never going to be finished. Um, but you know, can you still tell the story and do it justice with what you have? And, and that's, so that's important to me, but, um, yeah, absolutely. Those, those kinds of, those resources are really helpful for, um, this type of, of true crime. And, and these are also, I want to point out, these are also really great places to find stories. So, you know, if you're interested in writing true crime and, you know, you don't have a story in mind, but, you know, these museum departments, these archive departments, a lot of these libraries, they have all this kind of stuff. And, and you can find some really great stories just by, by going to some of these places, too. So um, if that is what your interest uh, is in. Oh, and Ancestry.com, too. I use that. Like Jane said, she contacted family members, and I was able to contact some as well. And it's really interesting, too, in that respect, is that a lot of the family members didn't even know that they had um, an ancestor who was hanged. And a lot of that, I think, is culturally, um, it, was, it was so stigmatized to have anyone in your family in prison, let alone executed. So they didn't pass these stories on to their family members, and a lot of people had no idea. Um, that they even had this person in their family. And I think mean, I think it was one time I, one woman that didn't interest her at all when she found out because she's like, but do you know anything about my grandmother? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, but she wasn't involved as far as I know. <laughs> um, so that was interesting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's you know, you're really kind of only limited by your, you know, these days by kind of your imagination in a way, but because there's just so much out there and so many avenues, um, luckily for us. Yeah, it's interesting because now I'm thinking about a couple stories we've unearthed, me and, well, mostly my colleague who's really good at this stuff and wondering, you know, where could I go next? You know, because there's been a couple of those that got blocked and stopped and I, can empathize with that, you know, that feeling of wanting to keep going and digging up more. So going back to some of those cases. <laughs> so why don't we talk about, so I know that both of you write some fiction. So how do you use those fiction techniques to tell the story of your cases? April, we'll start with you this time. I, I'm very interested in all of the different types of fiction you've written. Um, yeah, I, my first fiction, um, was women's fiction, it was, it was um, almost like historical women's fiction. It's um, humorous women's fiction. So I went from humor to writing true crime and now a YA, uh, a contemporary YA that's less comedic. Um, but I, cause I just, I really love all types of writing. And I, the original approach I took to Folsom was more of a journalistic approach. And, and I, didn't use a lot of fiction techniques, although I did it a few times. And so when my new editor was reading through the original uh, manuscript, you know, she pointed out, she highlighted all of these sections where um, I, 
I did kind of um, illustrate more. And she loved those. And she said, let's, let's think about doing that more with the retelling. And so, you know, the word illustrative just sticks in my mind all the time as I'm writing. And I think what's so great about that is being able to draw out details of the known environment, basically, and, and incorporating the five senses. So, you know, when I read about one of the defendants, what he was wearing and what the weather conditions were, you know, I want to incorporate those because I think that it gives the reader a much more dynamic, engaging experience, um, you know, and, and like talking about the conditions at Folsom Prison at the time that, you know, it was built of thick, cold, gray granite. And, you know, how can I um, bring out some of those details? Um, and, you know, I think it helps ground the reader also in the story, gives them more context. I think it makes them care more uh, about these individuals as well. Um, and I, I, it just makes it for, it, it's more fun for me to write too. And I have all of this information and it's so interesting about the, you know, just basically kind of even just down to what they were wearing is really interesting. And Eric Larson, who wrote The Devil in the White City, he's kind of a master at this. And I've, and I've read that book twice because I love it so much because he's nonfiction, but he, it reads like fiction. And Kate Moore, who wrote Radium Girls, she does this very well. So I'm trying to do that more. And I think because I'm also taking more of a social justice um, approach to the book and kind of bringing out a lot of those issues um, that were going on at the time, I think it helped maybe engage the reader more and get them to be more involved and to care more even. So that is what I'm aiming for, at least with the, with the rewrite. I like, I like that grounding in the setting and really immersing the reader in. Cause you're not, I'm not making anything up. I mean, these are, these are certainly facts and, and I'm just bringing, I'm enhancing them, I guess I'm bringing them more to light. And I think that's really good for, for both me and um, to have fun writing and combine both my passions of fiction and nonfiction and then really make a great experience for the reader. Jane, how about you? You know, again, she said it. <laughs> she said it all. You know, um, I read a couple of books on narrative nonfiction. And um, so, you know, it's interesting to me to know what these people wore, mm -hmm. what color their eyes were. Um, mm -hmm. You know, um, how women wore their hair. And I, I think if it's interesting to me, it's going to be interesting to the reader. And um, yeah, I like to find out about uh, these people's family, you know, where they came from. I like to set the scene because um, I think that, well, that's what's interesting to me. I mean, that's what always grabs me. Um, and, you know, when you're writing history, you have to know something about the times, you know. I've got books on guns in there, uh, you know, on different um, cities and towns. It's just, you know, I, I really can't add a whole lot because that's what's interesting. That's what I think interests people is, uh, yeah. you know, knowing what these people looked like and what made them tick. And also, if you can, you know, if you can get quotes, you know, I, I love quotes. I, mm -hmm. you know, I always use those. And if, you know, if they're from a newspaper, I, I attribute them to the newspaper, you know, that it, it came from such and such a newspaper. And yeah. those newspapers, of course, the, there was no byline, so we don't know who the reporter was. But um, I'm not sure if you're allowed to talk about that one case. Yeah, I can. I you like. can? No, okay. I will. So why don't we start with April? Because I know that Jane has a story. So what is the wildest case you've ever written about? Oh my gosh. In your case, April, you know, you've got a lot to draw. Yeah. <laughs> I do have a lot to choose from, and they all are wild in their own way. Um, I mean, the one, I mean, there's a couple that, that stand out. One of them um, is from 1925, and he was the 52nd execution. 
and his name was Alfred Bollinger. But what was really interesting, fascinating about the the case was really his wife. Um, she didn't participate in the murder, but it was revealed that Alfred was her fourth murdering husband. She, oh, yeah, she had some really bad luck. She, she married, she had three other murderers that she had married. Um, she didn't know they were, um, or they turned to murdering ways. It was so bizarre. Um, she claims that she was cursed by a witch uh, as a young girl. <laughs> she came across in a forest and this witch said, you will marry four murderers and the fifth dot, dot, dot. <laughs> and, you know, before she ran away. And so, and it was a week after Alfred's hanging that she married her fifth husband. And as far as I know, he, he didn't murder anyone. But <laughs> what was really fascinating about the whole case is really her story and, and this bizarre life she led. Um, of having three, you know, four murdering husbands. Um, but I have to say, I, I always tell people that one case in particular, Jacob Oppenheimer, he was um, basically dubbed the, the human tiger. And he's my favorite for so many reasons. Um, and you know, his story spoke to so many issues in our criminal justice system. Um, you know, harsh sentencing, prisoner, prisoner abuse, solitary confinement, dehumanization. Um, and, and he was a writer also. So I kind of feel like maybe there's some sort of fellowship, kinship um, I have with him. Um, and he was also the only one of the 93 uh, who was not hanged for murder, but rather assault. So... Yes, and I have a lot of his writings. I was able to get copies um, from an archive library in California. And um, and so I, I absolutely love his story so much. In fact, so this new rewrite, my editors, she just kind of came up with this great outline and we're going to sort of incorporate his story. He's number 28, but we're gonna bring part of his story in the beginning and bring it back later and because it's just you know very um a lengthy story but also just so fascinating and so i um that was certainly um one of my favorite to work on um there was a gentleman who hanged who said that he he killed the owner of a mountain resort and he said that it was the owner's um the chatter of the owner's monkeys and parrots that made him do it. <laughs> so you, you hear, yeah, there's just all kinds of, um, yeah, absolutely. And, and then some of these, I just always say they're just stranger than fiction. I, I can't make them up. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, my question about the wife with all of the murdering husband, did they all get caught? Yeah. I'm trying to remember each one's issue. One, one had been in prison um, before they met, but he had, he was in there for for murder. Um, let's see. Um, she had, and there were two others. Uh, one of them did commit a murder while they were married, and then I, I think two of them were before they were married, and one were, and two were during <laughs> they were married. So, um, but they were all. Um, you know, held accountable too. So, okay, Jane, you don't have to tell that one story, but you can if you want to. <laughs> I may as well tell this one because because the book is going to come out the end of June. Okay. But um, when I was writing Ohio Heist, I you know I I I was googling looking for people, and I found a young man who worked at uh, a bank in Cleveland, <clears throat> and he. He was a teller that this sent out the money to the different banks, okay? And so he 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 was a very intelligent boy. His name was Ted Conrad. He was 20 years old. He was six feet tall. He had blue eyes. Uh, he was very charming, had a very charming smile, one eyebrow kind of arched up. And he also spoke French fr fluently. And he fell in love with uh, the Thomas Crown Affair the movie, The Thomas Crown Affair. 
watched that movie probably six, seven times. And if you know anything about it, it was Thomas Crown was a millionaire and he was bored. So he planned a, a bank heist and he got away with it. So Ted Conrad thought he could do the same thing. So on this one particular day, it was July 11th, 1969. He was at work as, as a, a vault teller in the basement. And he um, had been out to lunch with a friend and he bought uh, a bottle of uh, Canadian Club and a carton of Marlboro cigarettes. And he came back into the bank and he showed, uh, the, he had them in a paper sack. He showed them to the security guard and said, see, I've got this bottle of, uh, uh, this bottle of booze and these smokes and, and uh, you know, I'm going to party this weekend. This was a Friday that this was that this happened. And so the, he and the, and the uh, security guard kind of laughed. And he went down into the uh, vault again. And then at um, time for him to leave at 5 o'clock, he came up out of the vault and he stopped and he talked to the uh, vice president of, was it publications or something? I don't remember now. And yeah, for about 20 minutes. And he had his sack with the uh, bottle of uh, booze and the bottle of, uh, and the, and the carton of Marlboro's with him and talked with for about 15 minutes. And then he left waving at the uh, security guard and he walked out of the door uh, with uh, this, with the sack, with the bottle of um, uh, fifth of, of uh, Canadian Club and the Marlboros and $215,000. And he was never seen again. And that was until November the 2nd of last year when I was writing Wicked Cleveland. Now, when I did the research for, um, uh, for the story on Ted Conrad to put in Ohio Heists, I had uh, talked with the U.S. Marshals. And at the time, I talked with the, uh, uh, the head of the U.S. Marshals for the Ohio Division, and, or the Northern Ohio Division. His name was, uh, is uh, Pete Elliott. And his dad, who was a, a deputy uh, marshal, who had been, his name was John Elliott, who had been the marshal that had tried to catch uh, <laughs> Ted Conrad. And uh, he was in, in to the case from the very beginning. So I taught, I got the chance to talk to those, to those two uh, men. And one of the questions I asked them was, do you think he, and he's still alive? Ted Conrad is still alive. And they, they both said, yes, they thought he was. And Pete Elliott, um, the U S marshal, he said, Oh, he said, I think he's still alive. He says, I think he's lived a good life. He's probably <laughs> got a family. And um, so, and I, and I wrote about that. Well, then November the 2nd, this last year, November the 2nd, 2021, I got an email from a person, a source that said, are you still interested in Ted Conrad? So first of all, I, I didn't know who this person was. So I wanted to check to make sure that, it wasn't just some kind of a scam or something like that. So I checked the person out and certainly they were indeed a person. So I wrote back and I said, yes, you know, what have you got? So the person sent me a, um, an obituary for a man named Thomas Randell who had died uh, in, uh, in and around Boston, Massachusetts. So I didn't recognize the picture of him at all, but the, uh, the, the obituary, it gave the parents' names, which were the same uh. names as Ted Conrad's parents, it gave the same birth date, uh, not the right year, but the same birth date, uh, gave the same place where Ted Conrad was born, where he went to school, just everything. So, I, uh, you know, I'm starting to get a hot flash right there. <laughs> I mean, my heart was really pounding, you know, <laughs> to kind of cut this short, the um, I went on Facebook. He had been married and he had, he had a daughter. I went on Facebook uh, looking for one of their, their Facebook pages. And I found a Facebook page 
And it talked about, uh, you know, Thomas Randell, the father and the husband. And so I went scrolling down, down, and pictures of him were getting younger and younger and younger. <laughs> so I saw that, yes, indeed, it was Ted Conrad. So the person said, told me, I had talked, I, I talked with a friend, a friend of Ted Conrad's in between. And so the person um, had told me that they had tried to get authorities interested in it, that the FBI interested in it, but they just weren't interested in it. But I knew who would be interested in it, and that was the U.S. Marshal. So the next morning, I wrote an email to uh, uh, to Marshal Elliott and told him what I had found. And five minutes later, he wrote back to me, and he said, call me. <laughs> so I called him, and he took it from there, and they indeed did confirm that it was Ted Conrad. Oh, how fantastic. For two years he had been. And he lived, you know, he had, he had never did anything else. But he had thought that he was going to be able to come back after uh, the statute of limitations ran out from the theft. But he didn't realize that once he was indicted, that there was no statute of limitation. And so he, he just apparently that we know, he never contacted any of his family. He had uh, two brothers. Oh, my and his gosh. Family, um, his mother, his dad, never his grandmother never contacted them again yeah that would be the only way he could get away with it yeah yeah so jane found ted conrad oh, how I, interesting we had a writers group meeting the day that this happened they weren't allowed to say anything it was all over the news like people were there was it was on npr it was on, oh my gosh you know, fox 8 and all these cleveland channels and i'm like that was my friend but the u.s marshals never told where they got the obituary from mm-hmm. or who, who their source was. And I was glad that they didn't because at that, mo- at that time I was, I was trying to finish up the book and I, and I made the story of Ted Conrad. I made it the epilogue of Wicked Cleveland. And I really didn't want a bunch of news people, you know, but n- now that the book is coming out, I know that I, you know, I've written about it, so I'll have to talk about it. Yeah. So. <laughs> People will come ask yeah. me about it. When you told us that story, <laughs> I was just like totally bowled over. I appreciate you telling the story on this podcast. Um, so why don't we, we'll go back to you, April. What resources would you suggest to listeners who might be interested in writing true crime? Hmm. Uh, you know, it's funny. I think that's kind of a, kind of a multi-fold question. I, I, because well, I think, there's um there's kind of a, almost like a pre-research stage in a way that's I don't know I call it like an inner research if you will um you know if you are interested in, in um, writing true crime this is kind of there's so many different approaches to it that I think it's beneficial to identify your purpose in in retelling these stories you know is it for entertainment um, is it for to educate, to spark conversation, um, sort of like, what do you want to get out of it? And what do you want your reader to, to take from it? And do you want to stay neutral, objective, or do you kind of have like a personal involvement, uh, those types of things, and, and just kind of really kind of assessing, um, if you can, what do you know that you need, that you have to have, it's kind of like a non-negotiable um, as far as access to information and, and can you get that? Cause I would, you know, you don't want to spend all this time unless you don't mind just, you know, researching something and finding out that there really isn't enough or you don't have access to certain material. Um, and, and this might be more pertain to contemporary true crime for those who are interested in doing um, you know, more current era is you know, what's been written about it before. Um, what more do you have to offer to it? You know, do you have a new theory? Do you, uh, do you have a personal connection? Uh, are you comfortable even interviewing people and requesting information uh, and that sort of thing? Um, so I think familiarizing yourself kind of with those questions or at least asking yourself those questions um, as you go along. Um, and also I think a really good idea is to also familiarize yourself with the criminal justice system and the processes and stages and 
you know, and even though I, I had a deep interest in criminal justice when I wrote the book, there was so much about it that I, about criminal justice that I w- really was not familiar with. So I didn't know to ask these questions. I didn't know what to look for. Um, you know, so for instance, false confession, false confessions, um, that is very prevalent today and certainly was at the turn of the century because, you know, there were no protections in place for defendants. Um, you know, no rules on interrogations until the 30s. And, you know, I can now, I can look back at some of these cases and say, oh, you know, I, they say he, you know, it was a voluntary confession, but was it, you know? And, and I think that's kind of, that was a lesson that I'm, you know, I've learned and that I'm still learning. Um, just, you know, I have, you know, with all with my schooling and everything, I think the one thing I take away is, is that in criminal justice, um, nothing is ever what it appears to be. And it is rarely black and white, and there are multiple sides to the story. And so I would encourage people to never, ever, ever assume that um, you know, a process was carried out legally, um, or that the judge or the prosecutor, or defense attorney or anybody um, did things correctly. Um, I think it's it's really easy to overlook some of these details and these um, these stages that happen, but I think it's important to really understand um, constitutional rights. I think it's important to understand how the processes work, because then you won't really know if it's not working. And and so I think you know even just getting an intro to um, criminal justice textbook, <laughs> just something that can um, really familiarize yourself with the process and the things that you're reading about, because it's, it's just very easy to just accept things as they were, were reported, and it's rarely ever um, that cut and dry. So as far as resources and things like that, I think those are good places to start. And then, of course, you know, going to the archives and museums and libraries and and, and and just kind of going from there. But I do think it's important to sort of do some inner research in a way and to just make sure that it is what you want to do and that you're not going to be spinning your wheels or hitting a wall. And I know a lot of that you, you can't anticipate, but anything that you can anticipate, anything you can kind of do ahead of time just to see if it is the right project for you would probably be you know, fairly wise to do. Um, and then the other thing I would suggest too, it's, I find that it was so difficult to, um, I want to put everything in the book, you know, everything that you, that you find, there's so many interesting things. So be mindful of, of not going off on too many bunny trails and trying to incorporate details and side stories that, that don't support the narrative um, that you're trying to convey. And I think what's really great for true crime writers is, you know, having a blog, having um, a podcast or anything like that, a YouTube channel, things that where you can really kind of supplement the book a little bit with stuff that couldn't go in the book or, you know, really interesting things that I found along the way. And, and I did that when I was doing the original research uh, and I was blogging at the same time, so I would be able to kind of share with readers, you know, although this is, doesn't pertain to my, um, my Folsom guys, but, you know, this is fascinating. So I think being able to just sort of look at the big picture and, and try not to squeeze everything in there and <laughs> if it doesn't belong. And that, that can sometimes be hard for me to do. I like the idea of having that like bonus content fiction that's not as like people aren't as excited about that but when it's not for sure very special episode of a podcast like only your subscribers can Can get download this so (laughs) absolutely right how about you jane what would you suggest if someone wanted to start well true crime i think maybe the first place to start would be to read others true crime and see how they did it if you look at the back of the book there's always going to be the bibliography and there's always going to be the notes and you're going to learn a lot about where to go to find things you know in those notes and the bibliography 
and again, I'm going to say uh, this the same thing as April. I kept all of my uh, uh, my textbooks. <laughs> so I have all kinds of, you know, I took constitutional law, so I have constitutional law books. I've got, you know, I've got police books. I've got, you know, floor to ceiling books back there. And the other, the other thing that I have that has really is I have a very close friend who is, um, who is a detective. Uh, you know, I, I always know I can go to him if there's anything that I, I need to. And he's also has a law degree. And, um, you know, I know that, uh, that he would help me. I, and I have, um, you know, there's other police reporters that have worked for some of the big newspapers that, that I can go to for, you know, for help. If I know, if I need to know how to handle a situation, Mm -hmm. how to write about it. So I think all those things are, are important. And again, just like you say, you have to know why you want to write about this particular crime what is it that interests you why do you think it's important and you know really really think about those things and again you have to know that there's enough material there to write about and just because it's interesting to you a lot with any writing you have right to write with your reader in mind which some people don't always do that right so why don't you april 1st why don't you tell our listeners about what you're working on now and where to find you okay um well let's say i'm finishing up i will be finishing my schooling the end of this month so right now that's what i'm, I'm mainly working on and doing continuing my fulsome research uh for the rewrite uh, and so as soon as school is done, I will be basically still sitting at my desk um, <laughs> writing, which is great because I'm very excited for this um, new version. So basically, I'll be working on the revision of, of Folsom's, and I do have the YA that I'm hoping to get back to as well. People can find me. I'm not super active right now on social media. Um but you can, they can find me on, uh, at aprilj.moore.com and they can read more about Folsom at folsoms93.com. Most, yeah, those two places. I'm happy to chat with anybody if they are interested in writing true crime or anything else, or if they know anything about these guys, that would be great too. Um, <laughs> I'd love to talk to you. So yeah, that's where I can be found. Well, I I always keep a, you know, when I find something that is interesting, a crime or, or a person that I think is interesting, I keep a file on it. So right now I'm going through a file on uh, cold cases. And I'm thinking about maybe I might do an uh, Ohio cold cases. And I, and I, you know, I always have a, a novel in the back of my mind and I get it all plotted out and then I get bored with it. So then I go on to something else and start plotting a new one. And so there's there's that anyone who's interested in you know in me or my books or a a documentary that I have been in um can go to what uh, uh Jane Ann Terzillo and that's t u r z i l l o dot com that's my website uh and then I also write about uh, wicked women at uh, darkheartedwomen.wordpress.com Thanks for listening to the Indie Writer Podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode and will subscribe to hear our future episodes. We want to thank the Writing Block community for the continued support. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook, or at writingblock.com with no K. Remember to subscribe, share, and tell your friends. Thanks, everyone, and happy writing.